Dr. Gross. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's very special program, our Holocaust Memorial Program. And we at Torah Links, for the past several years, have always tried to have a Holocaust Memorial Program at this time of the year during the three weeks of mourning for the Beis HaMikdash. And some may be wondering or scratching their head, why is it that we want to have a Holocaust Memorial Program specifically now? Most communities mark uh, Holocaust Memorial Day in the spring with Yom HaShoah. Why do we want to do this now? And the answer to that question can very interestingly be found actually in one of the keynotes, in one of the lamentations, the liturgical lamentations, which we recite on Tisha B'Av itself. In the 25th Kina, it's actually about not the destruction of the base of Mikdash, but actually about the destruction during the Crusades of the great Jewish communities in Western Europe, Ashpira, Worms, Magensa, and just a, a, a brief quote from one of the lines in that lamentation says as follows, the death, the killing of these communities, the destruction of these community, communities is certainly worthy of mourning. On equal footing with the destruction and the burning of the house of Hashem, the Beis HaMikdash. But we don't need to add a, an occasion for mourning. Not to make it earlier, if anything, to make it later. But it says the author, But that's why I'm going to make today, Tish about the day when I'm going to arouse all of my pain, all of my sorrow for the destruction of the Jewish people. So the idea is, that all of the tragedies, all of the korbanos, all of the golios that the Jewish people have been through, dating back to the destruction of the first base of Mikdash and the second base of Mikdash and everything since then, the pogroms, the persecution, the Holocaust and the inquisitions, etc., and, and everything that we go through even in the, in the, for, the, for the past who knows how long. It's all connected, it all stems from the events of Tisha B'av. And that's why so many tragedies throughout Jewish history are traced back to Tisha B'av. You can think of it like, a, like an atomic bomb going off on Tisha B'av itself. But the aftershock, the after effects of that explosion are felt for years and years to come. And that's what all of the tragedies that we experience subsequent uh, to the Chorban Abayas are all the aftershocks of what exploded and what was destroyed on Tisha B'av. So it really is all wrapped up into one. And that's why no, nothing against Yom HaShoah, but it, it's also appropriate to mark and to observe a Holocaust Memorial program specifically at this time of the year so we can put the tragedy and the horror of the Holocaust into its proper historical context in terms of the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, which we mourn for on Tisha B'av. And with that, I want to now give the program over to Rabbi Friedman. Just pinning Safta myself, and then we'll get started. Okay, could everybody see us and hear us? Great. Okay. Um, I just want to give my own quick introduction. Thank you, Rabbi Gross. I want to give my introduction to Safta. Um, as you know, anybody during this program knows that Safta, that Ms. Zenworth is my wife's grandmother. Um, she is one of the heroes of our family. We look up to her tremendously. Um, she didn't, we're going to hear much of Safta's life tonight, a small snippet, I should say, actually. Um, and Safta did not have an easy childhood, but yet, is the paradigm of a maimon of somebody who believes in Hashem, serve, lived a life of serving Hashem, and also a paradigm of what giving means, the different many positions that Safta gave and helped out in, and that she held, the volunteer positions she held over the decades from the time she was a little girl helping out in the home through 
starting the Chavar Kedisha in her neighborhood, becoming a chaplain to help out in the hospital in Florida and later on in New York, and more and more that we're going to hear about. So Safta, we appreciate your time that you're giving us tonight to share your story with us. And I want a, a special shout out to Chana Miriam Waxman, who is helping Safta on the technical end of things over there to make sure everything works well. We have a national audience stemming from New Jersey to New York to Georgia. I think more, but I don't know where everybody is at the moment. Baltimore, of course, as well. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Safta, you ready? Okay. Okay, so Safta, can you just tell us, uh, just, you know, we're tonight, we're, the, we we saw, we, we said in the program that's going to be about your experience through Kristallnacht and beyond, but like you told me many times that you're not the beginning of the story. Um, you came, you, you, you came from somewhere and you were born into a unique family. So can you t- t- tell us a bit of your, of the family history, your maiden name is Safra, where the name comes from and what type of home you grew up in. Thank you, Mayor. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote my life story because my family asked me to. And I said, I just can't write my life story. I have to write my father's life story because that's the background that I came from. So I'm going to just start now with my father's, he shall rest in peace, Arab Yosef Safra and what family he came from. Now, my father was born in Germany, Frankfurt am Main, Germany. His father and previous generations were all born in Russia. Every one of all the previous generations was so frim. They wrote Sifrei Torah. The last one to write a Sefer Torah was uh, Elhanan Pincus. That was a great-grandfather to my grandfather. My grandfather's name was Nachum Avram, and he couldn't get the tools to write the Sefer Torah anymore because Russia was not that good to Jews. So he became a shoichet for grosser behemoths, big animals like cows, not chickens or ducks or anything like that, or turkeys. Anyway, and how to get a job in those days was a miracle. He heard that the German community, Frankfurt am Main, the Sumter Royal Hirsch community in Frankfurt am Main, was looking for a choice for big animals. And he got the job, and he moved with his wife, Kaya, to Germany, to Frankfurt am Main. And that's where my father was born. The Safta, can you just tell us, you told me your, your, your great-grandfather um, had Gili Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Elijah appeared to him. Can you tell us that story briefly? Yes. Okay, let me get this. Okay. Now, I told you that Elchanan Pincus was the last one to uh, write the Sacred Torah. And he went in Russia somewhere to, to perform a bris. And along the way, he got lost in the forest. And he suddenly saw a saintly person appear and show him the way. When reaching the end of the forest, he bid him farewell and told him that the others are not worthy of seeing me. So he felt that his Gilu Eliyahu helped him go where he was going. And he arrived there and did the bridge and so forth. Now, let's go on to another question here. So your father was born, you said your father was born in Frankfurt yeah. already. He already was born in Frankfurt of mine. He went to the Sumter Lefoyle Hirsch Yeshiva, my mother, who he married later on. She also came from the firm family, and her father was the music teacher in the, 
in the Sumter of World History Shiva, and she also went to the women's division, which was two separate schools. After, after your father finished school, Safta, what did he do like after high school? Okay, he wanted to go to university. He wanted to be a dental surgeon for some reason. He was very bright. He was top in his class all the time. And he uh, made a uh, application to go to the university. And he found out that in Germany, the university had classes Monday through Shabbos. That was the only way he was going to go to university if he went to the University of Frankfurt. So what he did was Monday through Friday, he went to school, took the classes, took the exams, so forth. He did very well on the exams. Came Shabbos, he would go to early minion, Ashkama minion. He would come home, make kiddish, eat something, and walk to the university. No papers with him, no books with him, no pencils, no pens, nothing. It was Shabbos for him. And he would sit in class. He did have somebody there, a guy, who took notes for him. But that was fine for for Shabbos. But when exams came on Shabbos, that was a real problem because you had to show up. You couldn't excuse yourself. So because he was such a good student, and during the week when he took exams, he was doing so well, he got special permission to take the exam orally in front of three professors. It wasn't easy because these professors could ask any question anywhere, but he went through four years of university going to school like that, and he did get his degree after. Now he told us that in addition to his becoming, in addition to his degree and his, his uh, as a dental surgeon, he also had smicha. Uh, that came later. While he was going to university, he was going to the Schneider Yeshiva in Frankfurt of Mine, and he was learning. He learned every night of his life. And I'll tell you now, we're going to go to the next point where uh, times were changing. Hitler was getting into power. And one night coming home in 1936, it was shortly after I was born, he was beaten up by the brown shirts. The brown shirts were the youth gang of the Nazis. They ganged up at him and they beat him up so badly that they opened up his head. They left him bleeding on the sidewalk. Luckily, they ran away and luckily somebody found him lying like that, got an ambulance and got him to the hospital. They took care of my father. They sewed up his head. They took care of him to get him better. When he was released from the hospital, he went to the, the police station to complain about what they did to him. And the police station laughed at him and told him, Jew, go home. This was the time already of 1936. Hitler was in power and Jews were having a hard time. But before they let him go, they asked him for his passport or ID. In those days, as a German citizen, you had to have your passport with you at all times and he had to give it to them. He was not happy about that because he had no ID on him now. Anyway, and he went home. It took a few weeks and he got his passport back. And since he was already a uh, dental surgeon, his original passport said he was her doctor, Joseph Safra. And, uh, but he became stateless. They made him a stateless person. That he I mean, they took off his they took off a certification, and they also took off the fact that he was a citizen of Germany. Right. On the passport. So now he had he was in bad problems because 
he had no rights since he wasn't a German citizen. And he, uh, what he did was, he was smart enough that he got a hold of his younger brother, Danny, who was in the United States for some reason. I don't know what made him go earlier. I don't have that information. And he told them what happened to him. And he told that his brother that I need you to get me a visa and a ticket from the United States because it's going to be very difficult for me. And his brother did get it to him, and let me tell you a little bit in between what happened. This was 1936. This happened to him, and he came home to my mother, and he said, it is not safe for us here in this country. I want to take your parents and my parents, and I want to take them to Israel. And while I'm there, I'm going to have the, take my exam for my for my smicha. So he was days. learning. So Safdie is learning all those years in Germany, but he didn't get smicha till he actually went to Israel in the 1930s. Because he was wanted, he wanted to get the smicha from Rabbi Mendelssohn and Rabbi Moshe Kapoel. These were very well known uh, rabbeim. And uh, he figured if he takes his in-laws and his parents to Israel, he'll, he'll take the exam while he's there. So he settled first my mother's parents in Haifa, and he settled his father, his mother, in Kapar Atta, which was not so far away. Then he made a visit to Rob Mendelssohn and Rob Kapel, and he took the exams, and... He became at his smicha, Yora Yora Yodin Yodin, one of the best smichas you can get. So, so Safta, let's move to Kristallnacht, to November tenth, nineteen thirty-eight. Do you how do you know how how old were you that when Kristallnacht happened? It's two years old. I was born in nineteen thirty-six. Kristallnacht was in November nineteen thirty-eight. It was shortly after, a few months after my brother was born. Do you remember it? Do you remember it at all, or just remember hearing stories about it? The thing I remember because I was, I was three years old at that time was, I was pushed under the bed whenever somebody came into the house. What happened in Kristallnacht was, you know the story, the Nazis came with axes, broke the glass of the shoes, every shoe in Frankfurt am mine and outside of the city. They threw out the Kumashim, Gemaras, the Durham, and anything else. And they made a bonfire in the middle of the street. Then they went to the Oran HaKodesh, chopped it up also with an axe, took out all the Sifrei Torah, threw it in the bonfire. Every shul, this was done. It was the worst scenario one can imagine. While this is going on, one of my father's patients, for some reason was involved with the Nazis, came running over to him and said, her doctor, you are next. When they finish doing what they're doing, they're gonna come and take you for the Gestapo work which means he was going to be put into concentration camps because they wanted his being a dental surgeon for their army. When he heard that, it just so happened that a week before, he got the ticket and the visa from the United States. The tickets from your Uncle Danny. From his Uncle Danny, right, by mail. He quickly took his talisman to fill in went to the bank to try to get money, but the Nazis were ahead of him. They closed his account. My father had a small shot that a friend of the family, Ernie Gutman, always loved. He went to Ernie Gutman and he sold the shots to him so he had money. And he went with a maid so it should look like he's going on vacation just with Talison to fill in. He took the train 
to Howard. Because the port was in Rotter the port was in Rotterdam where the boat where the boat was going to take him to the United States. On the train, conductor asked for his ticket, took a look at him and realized this is a Jew. Looks at the ticket and he sees where he's going and he says to him in a very nice way, I think you made a mistake. You should get off the the station before. My father thinks the conductor doesn't know what he's talking about, and he doesn't think anything of it. You've been slayed him, what stood, uh, more uh, people get on the train, he comes around the conductor, tickets please, and this time he looks my, at my father in the eye and he says to him very seriously, you should get off the stop before. There was a reason for it. You see, the Gestapo was waiting at the port of Rotterdam. I mean, the Gestapo had to, the Nazis had taken over Holland at that point. That's what you mean? They were in Holland already. They were in Holland. They overran Holland. They were anyway. My father got off the stop before, and the next morning he made his way to the port, and there he sees the Gestapo. Remember, they wear their uniforms, and they call out, "We are looking for a German citizen." who's a dental surgeon. Father looks at his passport. He has no dental surgeon on it. He just named his Joseph, his last name. And he's stateless. So when they looked at his passport, the Nazis, he didn't have the right person. A miracle saved his life, got on the boat. And that's how he came to the United States. If not for that story, if four, five years earlier, however long it was, if his passport would have still said doctor and German citizen, they would have they would have gotten him at that point. They would have picked him up at. They said he, they announced. They said we're looking for a German citizen who's a dental surgeon, but his passport. The police took it away from him when they made him stateless. He was just plain, a plain Joseph. Joseph. Right. So he got on the boat. Wow. He was not at that port. No. Anyway, so, that, so that's how your father got it. And then your father made his way to America and joined his brother Danny in America. That's what he did. And what happened, so, though... So those of you back left in Germany, what happened What happened to you back in Germany now? That is the worst part that came now. You see, they didn't give up not finding my father, the, the Nazis. So they used to come periodically to her apartment first time they came there, they took all the silver they saw. They closed up her bank account. They destroyed anything of value. They took her jewelry. And they can't, they constantly asked her, where is your husband? Where is your husband? And she said, he left me. I don't know where he is. They did this for a couple of weeks, and then they changed their method. They stopped coming to the apartment, and they made her come down to Gestapo headquarters every single day for the next year until we left. And they kept on interrogating her and threatening her that she's going to be in the concentration camp. They're going to throw their kids in the concentration camp. And they throw the kids away. She was not such a strong person, and she nearly had a nervous breakdown from that. This is a whole year. In Poland, uh, war, st war started. The next part is when war started in Poland in 19. Let me get this in 1990. Oh, no, not September 1st, 1939. War broke out with Poland, and the Germans took tore up the tickets that he, that my mother had bought to go to the States. Now that was a problem. There's no money. There's no one to turn to. Somehow, I don't know how she did it, she got a hold of father, and she told him the problem. So he now heard, he was looking around where he could borrow money, and uh, he, uh, He heard of a man, a very wealthy man, helping out a 
families in Europe and bringing them over. And he went and he begged him. At joint, the minister time, he went to the shoe where this man was, and he begged him to please give him money for tickets. And the guy just gave him the money. And he went ahead and he bought the tickets and the visas again, like just like my father's son, like Danny, his uncle, his brother Danny from the United States. My father did it for the family. Do you know who that man was, Safta? I don't know his name uh, because there was no way of my knowing it. But he was was an unbelievable person, and uh, we were able to get tickets, and we were able to get on the boat at Rotterdam, and we were able to come to the United States. So you also ended up going through Holland to get out. Well, they didn't go. You didn't go to Germany. Germany was not a place to uh, uh, to get on a boat. You had to do it through Holland in those days. Why? I really don't know. But I know we came with the Rotterdam. With the we were, we, we, the boat was the Rotterdam, and it was a uh, a, uh, a, a a what do you call it? A, a Netherlands boat. Well, from, well, so the so the port is also Rotterdam, right? The the port was called Rotterdam, and also the boat was called Rotterdam. In fact, it was the last boat that was leaving to the United States. It had so many people on it that uh, I didn't have a bed plan myself. I had a strange woman in the bed with me, this little this little three year old. Anyway, so Safta, even though the war started already, they still let this boat go. Because only because we had a visa from the United States, it was not a German visa, it was not German tickets, it came from the United States. At that time, the United States was not in the war yet, and it was neutral. And we were able, according to what my mother told me, remember I was a little kid, three right. years old. The thing is that we got on the boat and we made it to the United States. Now my father had to get Panosha. Well, Sata, before you before you do that, before you go get to uh, back to, to America, there was a story about you almost falling off the boat. Can you share that story oh, with us? Yeah. So yes, what happened was because the food situation in Germany was very bad. You know, uh, Jews had to go to shop only in stores that had a big J on them, standing for Juda. That means only for Jews. Those stores had fruits and vegetables, but it had no milk, no cheese, no butter, no eggs, no meat, no chicken. So for quite a while, I was missing a lot of the good food that little children get at three years old. So I was very thin, very tiny, and I was on the boat, and I was on the upper level, and I wanted to go down to the next level because my mother was there. And I saw her, and I waved to her, and she said, all right, come down. Now, in those days, there was a railing on the boat, on the steps, and but it wasn't closed, that railing. It was open. And since I was a lightweight, somebody pushed me when I was walking down. And instead of going down the steps the normal way, I got thrown through the opening in the handlebar and the steps. And a woman who wasn't looking at the ocean but had was turned around facing the boat happened to catch me like a ball. I mean, you were really heading right towards the water. She was laying, she was get the, she was at the railing of the boat, but she wasn't facing the water. She was facing the boat. And all of a sudden, she saw this ball coming at her. She went like this and grabbed this me, with me. My mother saw this. I think it took her life away. But thank God I was saved. Hashem was with me. And that person, and, you did you meet that person later on? Or do you know her? Do you know who she is? My mother never told me who she was. I didn't know who they are. I didn't even think of asking. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't want to talk about it because it was so upsetting to her. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so now you got you got to America finally. Do you know how long the do you remember how long the trip was across the Atlantic? Well, quite a few days because we didn't arrive till October twenty sixth, nineteen thirty nine. It had to be at least a week or ten days. And uh, so starting out in America, what did your father do when he got to America? He was he couldn't he wanted to be a dentist dental surgeon, but he couldn't because in the United States, he had to go to college two more years, which he couldn't do. So he took up his second vocation, the rabbinate. And he became a rabbi. And uh, he went to different cities. He uh, and a shul, started Talmud Torahs, did all the things that all rabbis do. Uh, we went, the first job he had was at the Young Israel of Willoughby Avenue. And after a few years, he left that job to make more money, and he went to Flatbush to a uh, Sephardic type of uh, Nusak Sfad. It was a shul Nusak Sfad in Flatbush. And there he started a Talmud Torah, and he performed weddings. And he did all the things a rabbi does, brisim, and all the things, and he became a rabbi. Then yeah, you, so shortly after that, so after you, became, you, you moved south, right? Yeah. After that, what my father kept on trying to better himself, you know, financially, he became a member of the Rabbinical Council of America, which is the RCA. And those who are rabbinim know that it's a very prestigious organization. And through them, he heard about... Atlanta, Georgia, was opening up a from shul called Beth Jacob. And he became the first rabbi in this shul. So if anyone's ever been down to Atlanta and has been visited Rabbi Feldman's shul over there, the famous Rabbi Feldman shul, Safta's father was the first rabbi of that shul. Random now, bit of Jewish, Jewish Atlanta trivia. Yeah. Do you know that... Uh, when I was in Atlanta, Georgia, when uh, Yaakov's oldest son was born with a bris. And when I, I gave my maiden name to some people there, the old timers, they said, Oh my God, I remember your father. That he was such a great rabbi down here. And my father stayed there for a long time. But you know what? There wasn't enough. He was afraid that he has four kids. The only ones who went down with him were my brother and myself, because my oldest sister got married already shortly before that, and my second sister had just finished high school, and she went to work, and she stayed in New York. But my, my brother and I went down to Georgia. There were no yeshivas there. There were three Shoma Shabbos people. One was the rabbi from the south side of Atlanta, I'm sure Eric Israel. You should, uh, Rabbi Ge his name was Rabbi Tuvia Geffen. Tobias. Rabbi, tu Rabbi, Rabbi Tuvia Geffen, I believe yeah. his name was. Yeah, in those days. Anyway, he was the one He was the one who gave the first sort of first kosher certification to Coca-Cola. Oh, okay. Now, my brother had to go to school. Okay, let me just first say, the first one who saw my Shabbos was Rabbi Geffen then my father, and then the other person was a shoichet, who shechted the chicken for us because that's all we could eat. There was no meat for us down there. Kosher food came from New York or from Chicago. During this time, we were completely shomer Shabbos, shomer Mimit, so we never did anything wrong. We kept the Shabbos and the Yom Tobin. We never gave an excuse for anything. Anyway, so my brother had to go to public school but he got special permission to wear a beanie cap, so he didn't go with a blazing cup. And did you, did you or your brother experience any anti-Semitism from your friends down there, or everybody was fine? Fine, fine. He went to the to public school during the day, and every afternoon he went and learned with the Charlotte. So he was doing Homish. He was. Had to learn to dive in properly, learn Gomorrah. 
By this time, we were there two years. His bar mitzvah was coming up. And the shoifet prepared him to complete the laying for the center of the week. He said the Bar Torah, he had a regular bar mitzvah, even though there was no Jews around, no from Jews around in the shul in Beth Jacob. Meantime, I went, when I went down to, uh, to, uh, Beth, to uh, Atlanta, I had just graduated uh, elementary school, and I went to Henry Grady High School down there. Since my, my brother's bar mitzvah... Just my father, we lived, where, when we were in Atlanta, the neighborhood we lived in, Grady High School was the high school of the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, I went to that high school. And my father decided that after two years of being down there, it was not good for his son. Now he's bar mitzvah. He needs a yeshiva. And he enrolled him in YU in New York, Manhattan. Yeshiva University, and me, who had just finished 10th grade, said, I need you to go to New York to look after your brother. I have to stop school, get a job, and get a place to live. Take care of yourself. You know, I never did anything like that in my life, but Hashem helped me. I went to New York. I got my my brother into YU. Got a job. Gave him money so he can get food because my father could only pay the tuition. He could not pay for his food and his clothes and his clothing and his laundry and everything else that needed him. So Safti, you said you never did it, and you said you never did anything like that in your life. But even as even when you were younger, like in New York, you still were very involved in running the house, right? Yeah, we were, well, because I didn't talk about that part. I thought I would leave it out, but I guess if you want me to talk about that. Uh, when we came to New York, my mother had a nervous breakdown. She was under constant doctor's care. And as we got a little older, she couldn't take care of us. We were four children. And we divided up the housework among the three girls, my sister Judy, my sister Ruth, both are older than me, and me. I was a little girl, and my job was to make the beds in the, ba the last two bedrooms and take care of the linens. My job was also to do the laundry at seven years old. I was doing laundry in the bathtub with a, uh, a, what do you call it, a, a, uh, like a, a washboard? A, a washboard, right. And we did that, I did that. But I couldn't bring out the clothing, I was too young. So one of my sisters would help me bring out the rinse, help me rinse and bring out, bring out the clothing. And we would hang it up in the, in the, on the line that was outside the window. And what about the meat after? Well, I was seven years old when I did the laundry. By nine years old, they said to me, okay, now your job is to kosher the meat. In those days, you couldn't go to a butcher and get kosher meat. That was out of the question. You got the red, it was slaughtered kosher, but you had to kosher it when you went home. How do you kosher meat? We had a, a gray pail, a big, wide gray pail that we filled up with cold water. My job was, I was taught how to kosher meat. How do you kosher meat? You put the meat with cold water in a big bowl. Safta, let me, let me interrupt you for a minute, just to explain the background, that even after meat, in case anybody doesn't know, even after meat is slaughtered properly to be kosher, you have to get out all of the blood. There's a whole process which, which we call koshering the meat to get all of the blood out. So that's what Safta is about to describe. I had to learn, I had to do the kosher of the meat. So what happened, we had a, a gray pail that was not too high, but very wide. And uh, my job was to put the meat in this pail, a big wide pail, and enough water to cover the meat. 
The meat had to soak like this for a half an hour. After the half an hour was over, we worked with a timer. The next process was to salt the meat. We had a brick with a special uh, pot that I called it that had holes in it so that it was put on the outside of the other side of the sink and it had holes in it so when you salted the meat and you had the meat lying on this thing that slided a little bit the blood could either go down into the sink or go through the holes so now how do you salt meat take coarse salt right not fine salt coarse salt take a cup and you cup you salt the meat on six sides now when you think about it how do you how does meat have six sides it does it has to go to this side this side it has a top bottom that's four and the other side the long side right. so you had to salt the meat on six sides and that had a lie like that for one hour again it was put on a timer this is a big job to do it was not an easy thing for me and we had to leave it there for one hour exactly one hour then after the hour was over I had a special cup I would open the cold water faucet and I would take piece by piece and reduce the meat enough times that every bad bit of salt from all sides front and back up and down left and right that all the salt was in this took type quite a bit of a work work this was not an easy thing and you were doing this at nine years old already we, we grew up very fast in those days and I, this took me a long time was hours because a half an hour this had to soak in water then an hour it had to be soaking in the oil in the salt already an hour and a half and then it took me almost an hour to begin the meat with the cup until every bit of salt was off and then it went into a shizzle and it went into the refrigerator and then you call it you can make the meat so I Safta, did. let's jump. I want to jump ahead a little bit, but I just want to give everybody a um, a notice that we're <clears throat> we're going to shoot to end here on nine forty five. If anyone has any questions on anything that my grandmother is saying, you feel free to send me a text. You could send me, send me a chat publicly or privately, and I'll try throwing it in there. And maybe we'll try leaving a few minutes at the end if anybody has questions as well. But Safta, let's move ahead to you know you met Saba, um, my my wife's grandfather. Leon Zenworth, and you got married. You ended up moving to Queens. First, you got married. You were living in Washington Heights, as a good as a good yucca. Move out. <laughs> so we got to Queens, and we bought our house here. This is 1964, and at that time, my oldest son Menachem was ready for pre one A. He was registered in the yeshiva in Kew Gardens next community to us and father couldn't afford to pay the tuition it was too hard for him in those days you're saying this has been going on that long already where people can't pay to there was a tuition a tuition crisis back then so he asked for a reduction and they were very nice about it and uh, they gave us gave him a break and for the next two years he had a break during this time, my father was doing very, working very hard, and he was doing a little better, and he was getting more clients. And he came back to the yeshiva after two years, and he said, I want to now pay full tuition, and I want you to tell me what I owe you for the last two years, because I want to pay you back what for the good you did for me by giving me a break. They were so shocked because 
that never happened. I and I don't that. think it's happened since then also. That's how he never took anything for nothing. Can you go move, well, let's move along a few years. Can you tell us about starting the, I know you, you volunteered in many positions. Um, I had a PTA, I'm a woman, you were raising money for Israel, even as a teenager already. Could you jump to the Chavar Kadisha? tell us how the Chavar, you, you, how the Chavar Kadisha got started in Queens? I'll tell you how it started. This was short. When my father passed away, he was living Stop, in Stop, I'm sorry, let me interrupt for one moment, just in case anybody isn't familiar with Chavar Kadisha. That's the Jewish burial society, which gets the deceased person ready for burial. There's a whole process to undergo. So, sorry, Seth, to go for it. And he passed away. I was told that 20 people who knew my father came forward to help with the Tahara at the preparation, the preparation for burial. What year was that, Safta? 73, I think it was, 1973. Now, you have to understand, 20 people came to work on the Tahara. What happened was, they had to have, they had to take a smaller group, of course, of four or five. And I was so amazed about this, that coming home from shul one Shabbos after he passed, I happened to mention to somebody. I was so taken by that. She looks at me and she says, Hana, you know that we have a Trevor Kadisha here? Really? I didn't know that. In fact, we just started a few months ago. Why don't you join our Kerb Kaddisha? I figured, why not? And I did. And Let me just say this after the why not is because you're busy working as full time an accountant. Your children were already a little bit older at that point, but you know, it's not like you're sitting sitting around like twiddling your thumbs. You know, there are plenty of reasons why not. Yeah, okay. Anyway. I did join, and I was for it for many, 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 many years. And I got to a point where I became a Rosh. A Rosh means somebody who's in charge. We would go four women that would go out on a Tahara, go to a uh, usually a funeral home, and uh, do the Tahara there if they had a mikvah. This is a mikvah. If they didn't have a mikvah, we did something called Tisha Kavim, nine tails, where you pay, you have two, three people at the head of a table, one on the right, one on the left, and one in the center, and you, you count to three, and you all three of you throw the water down over the, over the, the mace. And this is like Next best thing if you don't have a mikvah, but we and were very lucky. Safta, you told that you told me those once you ended up doing it in the garage of some non-Jewish funeral home. Oh, I'll get to that first. I want to tell them what it was, how okay. you do it. Anyway, I was doing this. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Howard, and we were in Queens was the first community that started the Kaddisha, and all of a sudden we got a call from different neighborhoods. In Brooklyn, in Queens, we also got once a call from uh, out in Long Island, where the Long Island Expressway in those days ended into a dirt road. I never was out there in my life. I didn't drive out there because I didn't drive in those days. Anybody else, somebody else went it. But we had to take all our supplies with us because we were told it's gonna we we're gonna be doing the Tahara in a Glacier funeral home. Didn't understand this, but we found out later why. Anyway, we go into this funeral home. I have never been in a glacier funeral home. I have never seen anything as ornate and gorgeous as how that funeral home is furnished. And I'm saying to my group, we can't do a Tahara here. We need to have a place where we can have water. We need to use, we have to wash a body. We have to prepare the body. We have to put, there's no mikvah here. We have to do tissue covering. I need a stone floor or a, a 
outside place this February. It is freezing outside. Go into the head of the Gracia funeral home. I said, you know, I can't work here. I need to have like, street, like a pavement, pavement type of street because we use a lot of water. Anyway, the only thing I have, he says, lady, is the garage. Well, ain't Bray Ra, no choice. It's, can you take your limousine out from the garage? We're going to use the garage. And it's February and the garage doesn't have heating. Oh, of course not. But it did have a, a, a hose in there, so we were able to use the water. Didn't have to run inside to water. Anyway, we did the Tahara. And I have to tell you, we were iced by the time we finished, but we did everything out peeped in. And then we put the mason, the, uh, we said all the tefillos that I have to be said when you do a tahara. Every step of the way, you have to say tefillos. And then we put her in, and we covered her. And I went inside, and I told the director there that put her in the refrigerator now. Um, I have to ask you a question. She's Jewish. Why are you in, why is she in this uh, non-Jewish funeral home? So he tells me a story that he was very, he, he's very good friends with the daughter of this woman. I guess the daughter wasn't from so when her mother died, she went to her friend, the guy she drew, her funeral director, and said, please take care of my mother. But he said to me, I remember her mother very well. I remember her mother once saying to me, when I die, I want to be buried like a Jew. So when I remembered that, all funeral homes know each other. And the Jewish funeral homes, no, the non-Jewish funeral homes. And somehow or other, he got a hold of Rabbi Zone in those days, who was head of the Hebrew Kaddish in Queens. And the rest is history. We, we did the Tahara out there so that the, everything should be ready. When Rabbi Zone came, I told the people when they should put her in the freezer that the Hebrew Kaddish from New York is going to come within two hours, and they're going to take the body to New York. And that's what they did. In fact, they took it to the nearest funeral home that was Jewish. And she, from there, they had a Jewish funeral. Um, so after Q now jumped to your, your beaker, your, when you became a member of the clergy. Okay. Um, my husband and I were married many years, but about how many years is it already? It's quite a few years, about 14, Around 14, 14 years, I think. I can tell you, 13, 13 and a half years. He died 13 and a half years ago. He died. And uh, what was I going to say? Anyway, so uh, what, what's the story you want me to tell? I forgot about how he became a member of the uh, an, a member of the clergy. Okay. Anyway, well, he got sick. That's the first thing to tell you. He got sick, and he was in the hospital, and he was in uh, rehab and everything. And when he died, I had a lot of. Uh, equipment to make his life easier. And while I was sitting shiver for him, I had a, somebody here from Florida who said to me, by the way, he died in Florida. He didn't die in New York. So uh, he said he has a son living in Florida, and they have a... A beaker like, cholam, a gamach. Oh, gamach, like a gamach beaker cholam gave me the number, and after the shiver and the shloshim and everything, I went back to Florida, and I called him up, and he came over to my apartment, 
he was in Boca Raton. I'm in Deerfield Beach, just 10 minutes away by car. And I had all this equipment that made my life, my husband's life a little easier. And he took one look at it and he said, oh my God, I'm going to take all of it. He said, I need a truck for this. I'm going to go back to Boca, get the truck, and I'm going to come back. And then I want to sit and talk to you for a while. Anyway, came back, took all the stuff. Then he said to me, okay, can you make me a cup of coffee? You want to know exactly how you took care of your husband. And I did. From everything, what we did, and how I tried to make his life easier. He said to me, you know what? We have a big cola in, uh, in, in Boca Raton. I would like you to join it. Because we could use people like you. I don't know why I did it, but I joined. Maybe for the same reason you joined the Chavar Kadisha and the PTA and the Woman and all that. It might be a little and, bit related, Safta. And I became part of the Bicha Kolem. I was there doing it two, three years, when one day the head of the Bicha Kolem came over to me and says, we're going to have a dinner. And for all those people who work for the Bicha Kolem, we want to give them a little covet. I want you to come and come in, and we're going to record you as you come in to the hospital, and go through the actual route of what you do when you go to visit patients and how you do it. Let me interject, right. Sata, for a second, just to explain that a Beaker Cholom does many th- a Beaker Cholom organization helps many, they, they help out whenever people are sick. Um, usually, usually within hospitals, but not necessarily. They bring meals to the family. They bring rides back and forth to the hospital, and they go in the hospital, bring kosher food to the Jewish patients, and make sure that whatever needs the patient might have, specifically Jewish needs, but in general, any need really are being met. Okay. So the thing is, I said okay. So we went through the, the motions of coming, went out of the, the hospital, and came in again said hello to the secretaries there, asked them for a list of the Jewish patients. I went through the whole spiel. And then, and how I visited the patients. And, uh, what is to tell from that? And they're videoing this. What happened is, they first, let me just tell you that, that the dinner that they were making, I didn't know they were gonna use this film with me at the dinner, but they wanted to show what the Bicca Holm was doing. So they had the dinner and I went to it. And after a meal and a few speakers, all of a sudden they say, we have a film to show you. And there are a lot of people there. My goodness, because the all of Boca Raton was there and from, from, uh, from uh, what do you call it, from uh, Deerfield people came and I see myself on the film, and I see them asking me questions and how to uh, to do what do I do when I go and how I do it and who who I see and what I talk to them about, and I couldn't believe it. It was me in that film, and because of that. A lot more people joined the Bicca Polem. Well, Saf, now, let me also just interject that becoming, you had told me that becoming the Beaker, joining the Beaker Cholim, at least visiting the patients in the hospital, yet you became an official chaplain, of yeah, official okay. Florida hospital chaplain, right? Well, not official Florida chaplain. But I, what happened was, one of the things I did when I went through uh, the hospital to and I only visited usually the Jewish patients because Florida is full of Jews. What I did usually, I would go in and visit the patients, and uh, I had a special booklet with me that said, I could say a Mishaberuk for them if I had their first uh, Hebrew name and mother's name. I would say Shema with them if they asked it. Uh, I would say Mishaberuk from the booklet that I had. 
and it was like a chaplain there. Now, and and then, was, and then you start. Then the New York asked you to join as well. They heard you're doing such a good job down there. They asked you to join New York. I did that for years and years until the pandemic started. I couldn't do the hospital work anymore. When I came to New York, they found out I did this in Florida, and they said, if you do it in Florida, you got to do it in New York. So then I started to do New York. Then, what else did I do? I said, that? We'll end over here. It's hard 947. Um, I just somebody asked me to ask you that. I said that your fa your, at one point your father was rov in Pocomokee Pocomo City, Maryland. Was that before Atlanta or after Atlanta? After. I'll tell you why. You see, my father took that as a, a temporary job. You see, my father took a test to get a government job. And they were looking for someone, a Jewish chaplain in a mental hospital that was ordained, which my father had sniffer. And he had a medical background. And this was Harlem Valley State Hospital in Wingdale, New York. And he went up there and he became their chaplain and he was there for many, many, many years. He started a shul there with minion every day. They had a lot of Jews there. He had a minion for Rosh Hashanah, for Yom Kippur, for Sukkot, for Shabbos. But he had to be in Pocomo City before? That was before, That was after Pocomoke City? Pocomoke City was before. Oh, there. So, Safdi, the, I'm sorry? He was only a short Pocomo City because he was waiting for the, uh, the okay to go up to Wingdale, New York for the thing. So when you became a chaplain, Safdi, when you, when you started doing Mikar Cholb and working in the hospitals, you really were going back to your father's roots. You're just, you know, that's that's what your family does. They just take care of people who are sick. Okay, I'll end over here. Um, part of the reason why I asked, why I want, you know, we we wanted to hear leaving Germany and restarting life is because, you know, the story of the Holocaust isn't just the Holocaust. It's the way that we keep, as 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 Jews, we keep moving forward. We keep in staying involved in Judaism, keep learning Torah, doing the mitzvahs. We don't, if we give that up now, then, so to speak, the Nazis, the Nazis win. When you wrote up, when you wrote up the story of your father, the way you ended it off, so I, don't, I don't know if you remember this or not, Safta. You ended up, but your last line, last two lines were Hashem will watch over our families forever. Hitler didn't win. The way that we fight back against the against Hitler and the Nazis is by making sure that you know we're we're not letting what they did to us stop us from living our Jewish lives and being involved in Judaism. That I have been very blessed. I'm the matriarch of my family because I have outlived parents' age, my siblings' age, and I am so thankful for whatever I have because everyone in my family, from, even from my father's time who wrote Sifrei Torah, has been Shoma Shabbos and Shoma Mitzvah. Something that's very difficult in this day and age because I lived in Florida for a while. I know what goes on with from families whose children go off the derrick. But I have been so thankful not one of the relatives of my life have gone off the derrick. Everybody is Shoma Shabbos, Shoma Mitzvah. We can eat in each other's houses. We all keep Shabbos. My father used to say when we were all young at home that when, when we get married, hopes that when he makes Kiddush Friday night, all his children will be making Kiddush. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. Everyone in my family, from all the way back, back, back in centuries, nobody left the derrick. Everybody is from. Keeps the commandments. All show me Shabbos. All show me Mitzvah. Thankful for that. Thank you so much, Safta. Wish you continued nachas from all of your children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. If anyone has any questions they want to ask, they want to ask yeah. afterwards. If I could just say, I just want to uh, put, put in a word, Mrs. Zedworth. Thank you so much. It was mamish a really a privilege.
to uh, listen to you share your story and what you were just talking about, the spiritual survival of your entire family is perhaps more miraculous than the physical survival of, uh, of your family. But it, it's really an amazing story and something that's very truly inspirational and that we can all learn from. And Yashikala, thank you so much. And thank you to Rabbi Mrs. Friedman for sharing you with us this evening. And thank you for having me. It's my thank pleasure. You, uh, have, a good, have a good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It is recorded. If somebody was part of it, um, feel free to shout out to me. And again, if anyone has any questions afterwards, it's my pleasure to put you in touch with Safta. Yeah. Have a great okay. night. Uh, I'm glad because some people of the family, um, like my son Shimon, he's on a plane going to Las Vegas. <laughs> well, make sure <laughs> so he gets he could... a copy of it. Okay. Um, well, yeah. it's recorded, so he'll get it. Yeah.